Yeah, doesn't matter to anyone. Take a minute, uh, take a, quickly identify yourself and then go ahead. Yeah. I think, good afternoon, is, I know, it's a very nice lunch, I think it's all digested, when it gets into the bread steam, that's when we get a little bit of a nappy feel. Anyway, uh, I think most of you know my name, Tu Y2K, I'm YK, and uh, I came to this country exactly during Y2K, that's not a joke. I'm a computer science engineer by trade. I work for the state of California, and uh, my day job is uh, managing all 58 counties' Medicare, Medical data at Sacramento. Coming back to this, uh, when I moved to Sacramento around 18, you know, 16 years ago, I was looking around and uh, looking for where I can involve more. And not 16 years ago, that's the when I think a Papa is just forming. So the reason I'm just giving you, you have to have that search or desire. I don't think so. You know, most of us uh, came from, I think, or majority of us are immigrants. And uh, in my understanding, this is one I find most obvious, stigma. We don't want to come out of our comfort zone, majority of us. Uh, Steve, I don't know, you may be born here and brought up, and, uh, but that's what I felt when I'm working with our Indian American people. We don't want to come out of the stigma. And my approach to bring them out to the mainstream society is touching on where they feel there is a value. And number one thing I can always win our communities, by and large, I can speak for Indian American communities, very comfortable, high paying jobs, nice home, good cars, kids are good grades, very comfortable, very secure. But I can hit on the weak area. If something happens to someone in us or our community, do we have a support from the at large community? is law enforcement is addressing us on a priority basis. Are they seeing the value? Or in their eyes, do we exist here? So that's where I touch. Can we work together, be visible, and empower our community to stand in front of at-large community? We are no longer immigrants here. And as you see inside, I think API is one of the youngest immigrant families in the United States. I think when I say that, if we need a law enforcement support or something happened to our community, can we get that same support? That's when I get the nods. We are in such a bubble. We are not visible to outside world other than the freeway or at the stop sign. So that's when I ask, can we go and join the police sheriff's barbecue events? And people show up. And I ask them, can we at least motivate yourself for your own kids' safety joining citizen assisting public service committees? It's for your own kids' safety at schools. I'm touching on the weak areas because we all love our kids. So I want to be part of volunteer, and that's when I bring them into the mainstream. So in a nutshell, my encouraging and what I felt in the last 16, 17 years, touching on where we don't have that exposure, but what we all feel we need something. I can give you a live example. On June 10th, one Indian American scientist, it is a big news, is missing. And we asked police Sharif, he said, you have to wait. Someone, the 911 call, you have to wait 24 hours even to even to register that. Since uh, someone was talking, you know, we have to have a different hats. So I'm going to put my, you know, normal community person hat. We did a nice fundraiser to our police sheriff. And I texted him, Mr. Sharif, I think this is some community event is happening. Could you please assist? Believe it or not, within two hours, 
we have a detective assigned for that work. I'm not just saying that. Involving and together, and all those people who are helping us, and they saw the empowerment from our community in action. So we have to show some of those for the people who are very stigmatic and they stay lay back and you know they live in our own boundary, very comfort, high paying jobs, good schools and nice homes. So those are the things and we are working on it and it is a little bit hard on my part but it is working. That's all I can say. When we show them the value and the importance, people are coming and joining as a community. We are empowering ourselves to make our local community a better one. I think I will address that one. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right, that's uh, C.W. Chen from CPCAC from Chicago. And my take is, I don't think any community development is possible without political empowerment. I don't think political empowerment is possible without the civic engagement, the community engagement. And my approach is the total approach involving everybody, nobody left behind. So, uh, but going back, uh, I don't know whether it's a usual phenomenon. 20 some years ago, in Chicago, there was a situation where six casinos came up at the same time. And you know what they did? They aggressively talked in Chinatown. And every single day you go to Chinatown, you see buses all over the place, thousands of people lining up going to the casino and it becoming a big problem. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So I brought together a coalition of all different organizations across the world, social service organization, merchant organization, religious organization, and brought this issue all the way up to the mayor's office. It by itself can be a big story by itself, but this is how we get the first page of bringing the whole community together. So leading to, we setting up the Coalition for Better Chinese American Community with the idea that we have so many organizations in the Chinese community, over 200, 200 of us. It would bring together, everybody got its own mission, but we would bring together just working on civic engagement, mobilizing community together. We can effectively articulate our community agenda, and we can really hold our elected officials accountable, and further than that, we can really uh, achieve the community development with the well-being of our community psychologically, economically, socially, uh, uh, all across. So this is how we got, so people ask me for a long time, how big is Chicago Chinatown? And I thought about it before, like problem is, our Chinatown compared with East Coast, West Coast, we're not big, we're not small. That is the problem. If were any bigger, it would be easy for me to master resources that I need, do a lot of things. If were any smaller, I can just go home and forget about it. We don't have to do anything. We just in that very kind of upper side. So I came to a realization that whatever we want to do, it has to be nobody left behind. Left, right, middle, old, young, old. I cannot afford to lose anybody. Otherwise, we're not going to be, get anything done. So that has been the philosophy that we become so obsessed all these 20 some years when I came out there. So, I feel very at home coming to uh, CL USA, looking at the diverse in leadership, inclusion, inclusive in participation, and we could talk, keep talking about the how to tell the great story. That's been something we've been so obsessed, we've been thinking about talking about for so many years. So, so just try to share with you my uh, concept of that. And uh, we have had some success story. And I'll tell you some success story. After we started software organization, for the last, within 10 years, we more than triple, uh, 300, more than 300% increase in the registered voters in the Chinese community. And we push for the law to protect the redistricting for the language minority. We redistricted our community, 90% of the Chinese in the one single district. We took advantage of a situation where we are celebrating our centennial Chinatown to come up with a message, a talk on message, to have a whole list of community agenda, that we need a new city. Give them a chance. They will live up to the occasion. They will produce. We learned that. Also, the inclusion in participation. Like I said, we cannot afford to have anybody you know, moving. We have so many 
issue in the committee, they were fighting among ourselves. We had to bring everybody together. So when there was a march about Peter Liang in New York, the WeChat people within one week mobilized 5,000 people marching in Chicago downtown. But there were people on the other side. People, you all know that case, right? Black Lives Matter people, Peter Yang people. So I called a meeting with 20 organizations and committees said, let's look at this. If someone can mobilize 5,000 people in one week, that's an energy in our community that we cannot ignore. But we may not have to address that issue, but we have to address how we're going to move that issue forward. So we call a whole committee meeting, try to realize that we are people of different sides of the issue, but how we mobilize their energy. So this is the kind of thing. And talking about the planning process, when we went to the planning organization, I told them, tell me the story. Um, you've been looking for me, but you didn't know that. We've been here over 100 years. You were supposed to do planning for this area. We were not included. They said, all right, you are. So they did the planning with us. Ultimately, that planning got the American Planning Association Strategic Planning Award. And after that, we come up with a lot of sub-projects. The planning found that our age is older than the rest of the city of Chicago. We start another report studying the walkability, age-friendly community, and then we have a parking study, and every time we try to do planning in the community, all inclusive, we have to come back to the issue. Is it benefiting the whole community? There will be different organizations fighting within the community. We always bring back, put everybody at the table. So when the Chamber of Commerce want to promote uh, economic, they always say more parking, more parking, more tourists. I have to ask them, does it mean that more tourism, meaning the Chinatown is more thriving? Let's make more restaurants, Chinatown is more thriving, or if we have a much more thriving residential community, then the whole community is up. The, the residential community can be economic, economic driving for, for the uh, a business community. So we keep trying to bring everything back to the community altogether, not just individual interest, side interest. So I'm just trying to give a point that we're trying to look at community organization, civil engagement, from a total perspective. We don't want to leave anybody behind. We try to bring everybody in. It's a very difficult process, but we have success because we have achieved what we have achieved within 15 years. And also, to the point that Chinatown in Chicago is being recognized the most thriving Chinatown in North, North America. Some of you, I don't know where you heard, but Google it, I'm not lying to you. And when we go to the government, the, the approach we take is, you have to engage the community, you have to engage the elected official. When you engage the elected official, you have to know what you're talking about. So you have to engage the expert. You have to engage, so we, we work with all the local universities. Every single issue before we go to the city, we bring all the data, my, my people said, we bring all the data. So every time China come, they know what we, we know what we're talking about. They took us very seriously. So, and, and we also give them another message. When you work with us, it's always a win-win situation. You give us a park, that park becomes the most frequently used park in Chicago. You give us the library, the library gives the American Architecture Award. It's the best library in the whole United States. And then if you're gonna give us a high school, it will be one of the best schools in the city of Chicago. We have a proof and record. So these are all the messages. We put everything together into one packet that's trying to move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I feel like we're having a brag sheet here. So uh, which city did best, right? So I definitely, you know, uh, good work from uh, Chicago. So actually, I live in Houston and uh, Texas. Uh, you probably all know uh, how Texas is, right? I don't have to explain too much about Texans. <laughs> so I feel like we can solve the nation problem if we move more Californians and New Yorkers to Texas, then we probably have a better country. Uh, but uh, th there's another, also another way that I've been working on is to help Asian Americans in Texas. Um, it, it is uh, just like any one of you, you probably know the resistance and the frustration working with the Asian Americans. So we are the one sector that doesn't all vote, right? We have the lowest voting and turnout among all of the minority groups. So uh, what I did um, you know, since 2016 is I 
just like many Asian Americans that became uh, interested in the political side and also helped the Clinton campaign. And uh, uh, so uh, recently I was working with an uh, Asian American uh, candidate in Houston. And uh, if he win this time, he will be the first Asian American congressman in Texas. And um, so uh, it's a very difficult process uh, because uh, uh, Houston and also Texas actually became extremely diverse. You probably don't know that um, Houston is one of the most diverse city actually in the whole state, in the whole country. And also the Asian American groups are tend to be very segmented that we don't really interact with each other. And so part of our job is really to unite very diverse and different um, Asian American groups and for them to interact with each other. And so in our congressional district, which is 20 percent, uh, 20 points uh, red, we actually changed it to three, per, uh, three points only three, but it's almost, you know, get equal. And we have two um, presidential candidates from Texas. You probably know <laughs> their name. Uh, one of them is Beto. And so uh, we work closely actually with Beto's campaign and nearly flipped the district. So that's a, a really grassroots relationship um, building we had, there, which is very innovative. And um, that's something that uh, changed the voter turnout for Asian American groups in the primary voting by 12 uh, times. It's made on the national news, in fact, the district. Um, so normally people vote you know, about 7 8% in the primary, but uh, some of the group after we worked with grassroots became uh, like 70, 80%. Some of the neighborhood uh, the Asian Americans came out to go like 70, 80%. This is really a huge increase. That's why it made to the national news. And this time it became the, one of the most competitive region, congressional district in the whole nation. And apart from that, Houston area also have 15 Asian Americans run in 2018 midterm. It never happened in the history of Texas, and among them, nine of them got elected. So we had a major party celebrate, you know, we have nine Asian Americans became the uh, uh, elected officials, and uh, that part of the contribute to our success this time. We, I didn't have any trouble to place all the interns, because we have at least nine offices to work with, and they are very excited to have Asian American students to be part of that. And as a matter of fact, last year we had 100, more than 100 high school students joined our campaign as intern or, work or you know, volunteers on our congressional campaign. So which is very exciting. The, the sense of excitement among the, the children are, are, are unbelievable. So that's a really unprecedented in our history. Um, the other insights I want to share about, we all know about uh, the challenge running and also work with Asian American community. Um, part of the, our campaign, why it's made the national news, is how we build a relationship and also funding the shared value. And uh, because uh, every community was sort of divided in this time, you know, fighting between left and right, so we really identified the key areas that every Asian parent or every Asian family truly care about. And that goes from environment, you know, and public education, and gun control. Some of this are public safety. These are really the area we truly share together as Asian family, and that really brings us together. And the other thing that uh, relates to the internship is also it's hard to get Asian parents excited about. And just like what uh, YK has said, uh, we're all very comfortable, you know, living in our own sort of like suburban area and not involved in the society. But what really gets them excited is the kids. As long as you mention to the parents, you do this, that your kids can go to Ivy League and they all get excited. So that's very important. That's why we're running this internship, to get parents excited. In Fremont, uh, Citizens for Better Community. And uh, before I even decided to run, uh, CBC already generated at least uh, one vice mayor and the three uh, school board members, uh, all, uh, all Asian Chinese. So uh, when I decided to run, of course, uh, I immediately got a lot of help from this organization. 
uh, their board member Albert Wong uh, came to me and, and, and really gave me a good lesson on how to run a campaign. Uh, I didn't win uh, for that election, but I learned a lot. And then in 2014, again, you know, I decided to run, and this time I got even more support from uh, CBC. Uh, Henry Ng also came in as a, one of my advisors to help me uh, really get the endorsement and also the, the funds. And I got endorsed by all the uh, uh, current and former uh, uh, public officials uh, that came from uh, the, the CDC organization. So you can see that you know I was really enjoying the shadow of the tree that was planted by uh, the people before me. Um, fortunately, I got uh, elected. And uh, then I, uh, in turn, tried to find more people in, in the Chinese, uh, uh, no, more Asian uh, American community in Fremont to later on uh, to run for public offices. Uh, during the four years, there are a lot of issues uh, going on in the school district. I would like to just use one to show how I use that to empower the community and also to look for candidates for future election. Uh, last year, um, uh, starting from March, uh, we started to get uh, into this issue of a very age inappropriate and a very aggressive sex education material. At that time, of course, uh, I, as uh, the president of a school board, tried to really engage the parents and eventually uh, tried to get them mobilized. So uh, for every meeting that would uh, talk on that issue, uh, we have hundreds of uh, parents coming to the meeting and speak up at the forum. And uh, the meeting would go from 4.30 in the afternoon all the way to 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so eventually, um, the, uh, that textbook got vetoed um, for our elementary school sex education. And all the parents and all those people that I tried to um, really empower got excited and really experienced the democracy and you know how it worked. So of course, after that, when I tried to run for, no, actually before that, after that, um, we uh, really looked into this whole process and identified several leaders that stood up and then tried to work with me uh, for this issue. And I encouraged um, each and every one of them to run for the school board, because at that time I decided to run for city council, leaving this uh, place. Um, of course, uh, we tried to get uh, in endorsement for those candidates, tried to help raise funds for them, uh, and uh, tried to even prepare uh, all the forums and debates uh, for them. This, this is uh, something that you know, we always try to, 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 to figure out, like, okay, if they cannot um, win the election last year, how about 2020? So we also have uh, the side of 2020 uh, so that um, we can start preparing those uh, candidates from last year. Uh, you know, just like me, those people, they ran for the first time, nobody knew about them, so they, they didn't win. However, through this process, uh, you know, they also, like me, got the experience and, the, and they still had the passion so uh, I'm very um, optimistic that uh, next year, for the, at least the, the school um, board election, you know, we'll have uh, more candidates like them uh, from the, China, uh, the uh, Asian American community. Uh, I have to say that you know, I use uh, my experience in New York uh, you know, uh, as an example just to uh, share the secret that actually education is uh, the, the very important entry point for the uh, Asian American uh, society uh, to be empowered, because you know uh, the, the, what we share in this community is family value, is, uh, uh, the, is that we care uh, for the education. So it's very easy to reach out to them, and, and then really easy to really get their, uh, get them fired up, and then start from the school district, then to the city and and up. Uh, so uh, I I believe uh, you know uh, of course you know each city has a different situation and you cannot you know use our model and copy to your city. Uh, 
Uh, however, I believe that this is just the way to show you how uh, a well-established organization like CBC uh, tried to uh, pipeline candidates, including me years ago, and also you know uh, right now to make sure uh, the Asian American uh, community members always have their representatives in the local public schools and in the city government. Thank you. Good afternoon again to each and everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Biscocho. I live in Alaska now. Every time I am asked to speak publicly, I'm ever reminded of m what my college professor told me. He said, Jesse, if you could only speak the way you write, you would be perfect. But no one is perfect, right? <laughs> so it's okay, I'm fine with that. But anyway, uh, I've always believed, you know, it's not what we say. Now I'm trying to justify huh, the way I talk. It's not what we say that really matters, it's what we have done, okay? It's what we do. They're like memorials, you know, that is forever etched in the minds or memories of people, you know, of our community. That's why I've always planned on what I have done. Now to share a little bit of my journey, how I was translated into politics. I was born in the Philippines, uh, born and educated in the Philippines. Half of my life I spent, uh, you know my age by that, but 30 years, 31 years of my life was spent in the Philippines, and I migrated in 1991. But even then in the Philippines, when I attended school, I, I didn't know why I was always elected as a, an official, you know, from my elementary school days. I was president of our, our uh, school, you know, from first grade, second grade, and then at the secondary level, we also have our student government, and I was also elected as the president. And during my college days, I was also chairman of the Arts and Sciences Department, but never, you know, I never knew it, you know, at the time. So I've always been involved, I've always been socially uh, involved and conscious of the issues affecting uh, the underprivileged, you know, those who are poor, uh, those who cannot speak for themselves, you know. And I've always, wow, somebody should speak for them, you know. And I'll tell you a, a quick joke, I mean, a quick anecdote about me, you know, because in a school setting at that time, you always have to tuck your shirt in, you know. So you be look, you look decent and, and good. And I've always, uh, I said, but how about those who don't have uh, enough money to buy clothes, you know, have other clothes to wear, because it's a mandatory, uh, uniform is mandatory. So I kind of became, became the spokesperson for this group, although I can wear the same clothes, you know, because in a way, uh, uh, my parents uh, were a little bit <laughs> better than some, some of my classmates. but. But anyway, so I got into trouble. Now I'm a troublemaker. You know, <laughs> they said because you you won't follow the rules, you know, then uh, they kind of gave me a hard time, you know, because of that. But anyway, uh, that's just one a simple incident uh, at that time. But then also uh, those affecting the the the, best, the farmers, and then the workers. So it's always you know a question in my mind: How come you know why is this ongoing? This social consciousness, you know, is deeply ingrained within me, you know, uh, in my consciousness. But then, in 1991, fate then, turn, you know, made a turnabout, you know, and I uh, moved to Kodiak, Alaska. How, how many of you are aware of Kodiak, Alaska? Okay, the, the the biggest brown, largest brown bear in the world, right? Fishing, salmon, and halibut. And uh, again, when I moved there, I, I, I noticed there are a lot of minorities, you know, specifically Filipinos. And most of them were educated in the Philippines. They have college degrees, you know, they're professionals. And yet when they work in the school district, they are mostly aged, you know, teachers age. And when they work in the hospitals, they're all CNA, certified nursing aides. And then some of them work in canneries. And I've met some of them are lawyers, professors, and. Uh, he said, what's wrong? <laughs> and so uh, I was, fortunately, I was hired in the school district, you know, as one of the uh, uh, bilingual uh, instructors. And uh, so we created this uh, advisory committee. You know, we started with an advisory committee. So we brought out all these issues, you know, where we have so many students that, uh, you know, are diverse uh, number of students in our school district, you know, how come it doesn't reflect, you know, the number of teachers that we have, you know. And there's always the stigma of the language issue just because, 
you don't speak uh, the English language well, it's, you know, I always believe, I fully believe that English, English, the fluency in the English language is not a determinant of one's intelligence. Do I, do I hear and agree on that? <laughs> you all agree? Because at that time in the 90s, you know, when the president of Russia speaks in Russian, everybody thought, you know, or, or, or anybody, there's an interpreter. But when somebody from the Philippines speak in, speaks in broken English, you know, everybody mocks, you know, or looks down fun. And I, he just persuaded me. But anyway, so I, I continued my involvement. So I, I became a member of the Lions Club. I took advantage of for the training. Uh, I'm talking about civic engagement now. <laughs> and the local uh, Filipino American Community Association. And uh, can you give me more time? <laughs> and then, uh, and because of that, okay, due to time constraints, because of my community involvement, because of my sense of volunteerism, you know, uh, civic engagement is like a volunteerism, right, our acts. There was a vacancy in the city council and all the applicants were uh, oh, seasoned politicians. And someone mentioned my name, you know, and volunteered actually submitted my name because of my community involvement. And then when we went through the interview, I was surprised, you know, because I was the one chosen. And the reason I'm sharing this, you know, you, you don't know, uh, somebody apart from the group here shared that we should be open, right? Because we don't know what will happen in the future, right? When opportunity comes knocking in our door, right? When door opens, right? We should grab it, right? Because we don't know when all these doors will open. And, and so I was appointed for six, six months, you know, May 1997, oh, I guess you remember. <laughs> And after that, so I kind of like it, well, uh, with all those time that I have been, uh, I have to spend, you know, we have these work sessions, and then the regular uh, city council meeting. And then, but then I, I, I sort of remember, wow, it's lonely sometimes, you know, to be <laughs> in the city council that I'm, because you have friends that they, they think that because they know you, you know, they think the patronage politics, you heard about that? They, they, they want to take advantage of that, but that's another point. And so uh, after that, I ran for office. I, fought, I ran for election after six months. No, I mean I ran for election, and I was the top vote getter. You know, I was surprised. I was humbled. And then uh, I ran again for a second term, and then I was elected as deputy mayor. You know, I had the opportunity to serve as like the deputy or vice mayor in in Kodiak, Alaska, and. And also uh, being selected as one of the, the second batch of the 2000 uh, Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, you know, at Washington, D.C. Uh, Norm Minera was our uh, honorary uh, chair, you know, Emeritus for Life. And those are the trainings that I took advantage, you know. Being elected also, you shouldn't stop there. See, I joined the Alaska Municipal League of Conference, you know, being involved in the different committees. So we, and I also joined the National League of Cities, you know, Mayor May mentioned that, I was in, in different committees, you know. So you continue to improve yourself, you have to attend, you know, to have, you have to be informed. You don't stop on your laurel just because you won, you were elected, or you, you were recognized. And then uh, there was an opportunity, again, when uh, our former senator became governor, appointed me, see, because you were now well known uh, for a state position like a special assistant. So temporarily, I have to hold my uh, political uh, position, you know, as an elected official. So I work for the governor as a special assistant. So, and because of that, there's still that, you know, like what I said, the community involvement or engagement deep within me. So I volunteer for the American Red Cross of Alaska as community volunteer leader and, and other groups. And then uh, I said, why? And because we, we know that what drives us in this political uh, or civic engagement are when there are pressing issues, right, that come. <coughs> so every time, every year, issues come comes up, right? Props up, you know, what, which is important that affects us. So we need to be involved. We need to be, we need to stay involved. That's why I would like to inspire you, you know, hopefully today, we need to honor our past, okay, before we can inspire our future. You know, how do we honor our past? Those who paid the work, those who have done everything, you know, for us. Me, I was fortunate to be elected and appointed because somebody from our community paid the way, you know, regardless of political affiliations, you know. We should honor them, okay? 
they paved the way for us. And also, we are paving the way for you, you know, for the new generation. You should ever remember that. And, and also, uh, if ever there is a vacancy, you know, in your, uh, wherever you are, don't hesitate to throw your name in, you know, and keep your always an open, you know, an option. That it's a simple formula. There's no secret formula. And when you run, you run to win all the time. Because no matter what happens in the end, you're all already a winner. Thank you. Thank you. on the city council. Uh, he's a city council member in Redmond, and he comes uh, uh, nominated <coughs> by uh, Lynn. Where's Lynn? Lynn, Lynn uh, kind of, uh, this person, he sends me an email and says that Steve is actually, are you on vacation? I'm on my way to a vacation in Spain with my daughter. Yeah. And then, and then he, he, she goes like, he wants to spend time with us. He wants to come visit and be in our program during his, on his way to a vacation. So to me, it says something about Lynn, right? That, that kind of relationship, right? With a city council member. It says something about Steve, too. And so I want to, my prompt for Steve is this. Uh, after hearing uh, our panel uh, talk about empowerment from the community side and also empowerment as elected officials, I want to have to kind of how does how does that resonate with you? Uh, the way we would treat you, Steve, is as an ally, right? As a friend of our community. And then, from your perspective, can you uh, tell us how you uh, when you hear these? What does it make you think about? Great, thank you, thank you, and thank you. So, uh, yes, I'm from City of Redmond, which is home of Microsoft. I would like to be able to say it's the home of Tesla, actually, because it's such a <laughs> cool company. <laughs> um, so, in the prior, uh, the prior forum, they talked about how, how you uh, mentor these, um, young people and how you get them to be involved and how to be active. What we've been talking about is why and why it is important. And, and when I listened to all of these different stories, it reminded me of a quote from Jane Goodall, and for those who don't know, she was a famous anthropologist who worked with gorillas. And what she said was, uh, everything you do and everything you don't do makes a difference and what you have to decide is what kind of difference you make. And uh, these people that I have the honor to sit with are making a, a huge difference in their community because they saw a need, they saw a vision, and they stuck with it. What I'm also reminded is, uh, and I think in terms of President Obama, he started as a community organ organizer and became President of the United States. So his mission got bigger. When I think in terms of, I'm going to date myself, but Martin Luther King, his vision started small. He wanted to help his community, but then it grew into helping all of humanity. You can also go the other way. You can start out wanting to save the world from itself, climate change, or uh, any kind of pending disaster. And then you can say, okay, that's too big. I'm going to focus on something smaller, a campaign or uh, you know, plastic ban in my city. So any of that is good. All of that is good. So I, what I'm reminded when I listen is that, uh, I'm gonna go really back. My parents cursed me with a belief that I have to be honest, have integrity, and always think about my community. I'm kidding about the curse, because it's hard to do that. It's really hard. So uh, what, I, what I wanna say to the young people here, when you see the example uh, and the commitment and the continued uh, pursuit of, of what you believe in, that's what it takes. And, and I'm, I'm also uh, reminded that you uh, need to balance your life. I think I heard earlier that, you know, that 
when they start, they're excited and uh, they're intense, but then their life takes over. They have to go to school. They have to get older, raise a family. Yes. So I see uh, what I implore people to do is create that balance in their life and a budget some part of your life to improving and uh, making sure that you're part of that community. Uh, with respect to an ally, one of the, my purpose, or one of the reasons that I in, in uh, elected, and I like to say, by the way, elected representative. I know we say elected official, but we're really representatives, and we're representing you. And, and uh, when YK talked about a seat at the table, the reason I say democracy intact is that seat at the table exists. It's there. You may not see it, but it's there. And as long as we have democracy, and as long as we reclaim our democracy through things like Apapa, that seat is always there for the next generation. It's critically important that you understand that you don't have to fight for that seat. That seat is there. And the other thing I heard is stigma. And uh, nobody, nobody throughout all of our community, whatever culture, wherever you came from, should feel diminished and less than what every person has a right to be. And that's a voice for their interests, for the interests of their neighbors, and the interest of the community. So when I hear these voices, uh, it, it's, I see uh, not so much that I'm an ally, but that you all are allies of my purpose, which is to make sure that that democracy intact and that freedom of choice exists for everybody's children, my grandchildren, anybody who wants to claim that. So, thank you. about bringing people together. That is not easy. 
That is never easy. And bringing people together to actually work and make something happen, that is so hard. And working with city politics as in Chicago, right? But what's the vision? What's your vision? What's the best vision that you can have for yourself? What's the best version that you can challenge yourself, right? And so he chose a very difficult path, which is to bring together, not leave people behind, not only cater to the people who are elites, not cater to people who are already doing well, but to think about other people in our community that are not doing as well. That takes a lot of commitment. That takes a lot of vision. And to really include them. How do you walk that walk? So it is a practice, but I am sure that for him, for other people, when it happens, it's very satisfying. Right? That's why we are all in this. So I want you know, to challenge you all too as you listen to them. Think about yourself. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Right? Don't limit yourself. But truthfully, it's not for everyone either. Does that make sense to you? Right? But since we're in this kind of arena, we have to think about it. Right? We have to really think seriously about how we, you know, how we engage in that. And do we always just do the same thing? Or do we have a journey, right? And so hopefully from year to year, you will come back and you will report to us where you are in your journey, all right? So, uh, so uh, this is, we're coming to the end of today's program. Today is the heavyweight program in a way. Uh, I want to thank you for being so engaged, being so good and so thoughtful, caring so much giving so much of your time, your energy.